This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year 1986, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1986. We also look at the case for putting Ario Speedwagon into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Walk of Fame is, of course, the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Hollywood, California. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1986. In Music for the Year 1986, the Monkees went on a reunion tour after gaining renewed popularity because MTV started running TV episode marathons of the group's original TV show from back in the 1960s. Bob Geldof was given knighthood by the Queen for his efforts to end hunger in Africa. Alternative music, also known as college radio back in the day, began to show up on mainstream radio stations, with artists like R.E.M. and In Excess getting modestly popular before then becoming superstars in their own right in the early 1990s. Whitney Houston's debut self-titled album was the biggest album of the year. It was also the year of Hart's self-titled album, ZZ Top's Afterburner, Dire Straits' Brothers in Arms, Janet Jackson's Control, Mr. Mister's Welcome to the Real World, Charday's Promise, Phil Collins' No Jacket Required, and Gloria Stefan and Miami Sound Machine's Primitive Love. It was also the year of the Top Gun soundtrack, with big hits by Kenny Loggins and Berlin, Madonna's True Blue album, Peter Gabriel's hit album So, the return of Van Halen with Sammy Hagar as the new frontman, Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet, which helped to usher in the hairband era into the mainstream, and Steve Winwood had his comeback album that year with Back in the High Life. That's What Friends Are For by Dionne Warwick and Friends was the biggest single of the year. The other big singles for the year included Say You, Say Me by Lionel Richie, which was from the movie soundtrack to the film White Nights, starring Mikhail Baryshnikov and also Gregory Hines and Isabella Rossellini. Little trivia for you. Also, I Miss You by Climax, On My Own by Patti LaBelle and Michael McDonald, Mr. Mister's Broken Wings, Whitney Houston's How Will I Know, Party All the Time by Eddie Murphy, Survivor's Burning Heart, Mr. Mister's Curie, Falco's Rock Me Amadeus, Madonna's Papa Don't Preach, Berlin's Take My Breath Away, Pet Shop Boys' West End Girls, Mike and the Mechanics, All I Need is a Miracle, Kenny Loggins' Danger Zone, Lionel Richie's Dancing on the Ceiling, Force MD's Tender Love, and Robert Palmer's Addicted to Love. The top country albums for 1986 included Number 7 by George Strait, Black and White by Janie Fricke, Alabama's Greatest Hits, and also their album The Touch, Guitar Town by Steve Earle, Guitars, Cadillacs, Etc., Etc. by Dwight Yoakam, Montana Cafe by Hank Williams Jr., The Promised Land by Willie Nelson, Storms of Life by Randy Travis, Reba McIntyre's What Am I Gonna Do About You, and also her album Whoever's in New England, and Wheels by Restless Heart. For the first time on the Billboard magazine Country Music Singles chart, no song held the number one slot for longer than one week. When all was said and done, the song that was the biggest country single that year was really a pop single that had crossed over to the country chart. Billy Vera and the Beaters song, At This Moment, became a huge country pop crossover hit due to the fact that it was featured on an episode of the Michael J. Fox hit TV series Family Ties that used it for one episode. Other big country songs were Roseanne Cash's Never Be You, Kenny Rogers' Morning Desire, and also Tomb of the Unknown Love, Lionel Richie's Deep River Woman, Reba McIntyre's Whoever's in New England, Steve Warner's You Can Dream of Me, Hank Williams Jr.'s Mind Your Own Business, 
The Forrester sisters, Justin Casey and Red and D. Travis is, on the other hand. 1986 has been called the year that rap music went from being old school to beginning its golden age, as it broke into the mainstream with hit albums like Run DMC's Raising Hell and the Beastie Boys' A License to Ill. Other important albums were released by Africa Bombada and Soul Sonic Force, Salt and Peppa, Stetsa Sonic, Cool Mo D, Houdini, UTFO, The Fat Boys, and Grandmaster Flash. As far as singles went, aside from Rum DMC with Walk This Way, It's Tricky, My Adidas, and Peter Piper, and the Beastie Boys with Paul Revere, No Sleep Till Brooklyn, The New Style, and Fight for Your Right to Party, Eric B. and Rakim released Eric B. as President and also My Melody. Boogie Down Productions released South Bronx. MC Shan released The Bridge. Stetsa Sonic released Ghost Stetsa 1 and also My Rhyme. Cool G Rap and DJ Polo released It's a Demo. And DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince released Girls Are Nothing But Trouble. Dance music was still the domain of pop and R&B artists doing remixes. However, in the clubs, house and trance music filled the speakers with both being considered music of black, Latino, and gay people and thus underground music. Still, there were club hits like Grace Jones' iconic song Slave to the Rhythm, Colonel Abrams' I'm Not Gonna Let, and Dar Braxton's Jump Back Set You Free that joined songs by Janet Jackson like What Have You Done For Me Lately, Madonna's Papa Don't Preach, and also Open Your Heart, along with Falco's Rock Me Dama Deus, Bananarama's Venus, The Human League's Human, New Shoes' I Can't Wait, and Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer onto the dance charts, as pop dance still ruled both pop and dance. Let's be blunt, though. Most of the pop songs that hit the dance charts, even some of the ones that I just mentioned, were not really dance songs. Record labels were trying to prop up their artists and tried to get their songs qualified for the dance charts by doing some really strange remixes of some songs. That way, they could say that their song had hit the top 10 on multiple charts. Get it? Cute game, record labels. Cute game. There were also acts that piggybacked on the Like a Virgin, True Blue, Madonna era sound because, as we all know, imitation is the sincerest form of a lack of imagination, although it will get you popularity on your own. Case in point, Regina's Baby Love and Alicia's Baby Talk both hit number one on the Billboard Club play chart by essentially cutting and pasting Madonna sound. It's what record labels do with every hot genre. See boy bands, hair bands, grunge, EDM, etc., etc. The top Latin artists of 1986 were Menudo, Jose Feliciano, Cheyenne, Johnny Ventura, Emmanuel, Paquito Guzman, Los Bucas, Bronco, and La Mafia. Musicals and revivals of musicals that opened in either London or on Broadway included The Phantom of the Opera, La Caja Faux, Chess, Sweet Charity, Time, Charlie Girl, and Me and My Girl. Musical movies that came out in 1986 included Labyrinth, HMF's Pinafore, Little Shop of Horrors, Under the Cherry Moon, Crossroads, Babes in Toyland, and Absolute Beginners, along with the animated musicals An American Tale and My Little Pony, the movie. Bands that formed in 1986 included the Afghan Wigs, the Beatmasters, Big Head Todd and the Monsters, Climby Fisher, No Doubt, Company B, Cowboy Junkies, the David Lee Roth Band with guitarist Steve Vai, Eric B. and Rakim, Faster Pussycat, Frontline Assembly, the Ghetto Boys, the Goo Goo Dolls, Jesus Jones, Johnny Hates Jazz, King Missile, the Lemonheads, Leaders of the New School, Manic Street Preachers, M.O.D. D-24-7 Spies, Morbid, N.W.A., Naughty by Nature, Nelson, The Pixies, Prong, Roxette, Toad the Wet Sprocket, Timbuk 3, Tapau, Transvision Vamp, The Veld, Sweethearts of the Rodeo, The Sugar Cube, Skid Row, Stabbing Westward, and Texas. 
The music magazine Q also launched in 1986. And if you are now beginning to think that 1986 was a really good year for music, you would be 100% correct. Queen played their final concert with the lineup of Freddie Mercury, Brian May, Roger Taylor, and John Deacon. The Smiths called it quits just as they were beginning to hit the mainstream. Also calling it quits in 1986, Wham! Along with Black Flag, ELO, otherwise known as Electric Light Orchestra, Men at Work, Arcadia, Asia, Boney M, The Boomtown Rats, Thin Lizzy, Matumi, Utopia, The Clash, Confunction, Culture Club, Weather Report, The Dead Kennedys, Emerson, Lake, and Powell, The Flock of Seagulls, Pablo Cruz, The Police, and Prince and the Revolution. At least one third of those bands got back together to do those nostalgia tours that are popular these days, including the Revolution, even without Prince. DJ Snake, DJ Alice in Wonderland, Lady Gaga, Drake, Ellie Goulding, Solange Knowles, Florence Welsh of Florence and the Machine, Kelly Pickler, Skylar Gray, John Baptiste, Charlotte Church, Alex Turner of Arctic Monkeys, Ollie Sykes of Bring Me the Horizon, Matt Heafy of Trivium, Mario, Hilary Scott of Lady Antebellum, now known as Lady A, Jimmy Allen, Ashley Monroe of the Pistol Annies, violinist Lindsey Sterling, bassist Tal Wilkenfeld, Kevin Parker, a.k.a. Tame Impala, David Jones of McFly, singers, actresses Cassie, Leia Michelle, Leighton Meester, Lindsay Lohan, Emmy Rossin, Leaky Lee, and Stacey Orico, along with actress and DJ Ruby Rose and rapper Kevin Gates, were all born in 1986. Musical artists who passed away in 1986 included Cliff Burton of Metallica, who was killed when Metallica's tour bus was involved in an accident, Phil Lynott of Thin Lizzy, Richard Manuel of The Band, entertainer extraordinaires Desi Arnaz, Kate Smith, Dean Reed, Gordon McRae, and Scatman Crothers, manager Albert Grossman, disc jockeys John R. and William B. Williams, guitarist Robbie Basho, record executive Moses Ash of Ash Records, jazz trumpet player Thad Jones, singer Esquerita, saxophonist Eddie Lockjaw Davis, Tracy Pugh of the Saints, singer and blues guitarist Bea Booz, singer Lee Dorsey, Billy Rancher of Billy Rancher and the Unreal Gods, Hollywood Fats of Canned Heat, Tommy Kiefer of Crocus, John Farrell of Return to Forever, harpist Dorothy Ashby, jazz saxophonist Hank Mobley, guitarist Clarence Garlow, folk singer Kate Wolf, the King of Swing himself, band leader Benny Goodman, blues harmonica player Sonny Terry, O'Kelly Isley Jr. of the Isley Brothers, country guitarist Joe Maphis, Bobby Nunn of the Coasters, and singer Mark Dinning. All of them died in 1986. In award ceremonies for the music of 1986, Graceland from Paul Simon won Album of the Year at the Grammy Awards. That's What Friends Are For from Dionne Warwick, Sir Elton John, Gladys Knight, and Stevie Wonder won Song of the Year. Steve Winwood won Record of the Year for Higher Love with Shaka Khan. And Bruce Hornsby and the Range won Best New Artist. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Dire Straits' Money for Nothing won Music Video of the Year. At the American Music Awards for the music of 1986, Whitney Houston, Lionel Richie, and Huey Lewis and the News were the big winners. Luther Vandross, Janet Jackson, and Cameo were the big winners at the very first Soul Train Music Awards. Kenny Rogers, Lionel Richie, Madonna, Whitney Houston, and Alabama won the musical categories at the People's Choice Awards. As a testament to how popular country music was at that time, it was the only music category that had its own category for all those awards, for the People's Choice Awards at least. That was the one that Kenny Rogers actually won while country superstars Alabama won Best Overall Group. So Kenny Rogers won for Best Country Artist. The Billboard Music Awards, for your knowledge, didn't actually start until 1990. 
at the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Bergen, Norway, Sandra Kim from Belgium won. At 13 years old, she became the youngest Eurovision winner ever. Reba McIntyre won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, while Hank Williams Jr. won the Academy of Country Music Entertainer of the Year Award. Dire Straits won Best Album for Brothers in Arms, and the Pet Shop Boys won Best Single for West End Girls at the Brit Awards. Glass Tiger won Album of the Year for The Thin Red Line, and they also won Song of the Year for Don't Forget Me at the Juno Awards. John Farnham won Album of the Year for Whispering Jack, and he also won Song of the Year for You're the Voice at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, The Mystery of Edwin Drood won Best Musical and Sweet Charity won Best Revival of a Musical. Musically at the Academy Awards, Herbie Hancock won Best Original Film Score for Round Midnight, while Take My Breath Away from Top Gun won Best Original Song. The Pulitzer Prize in Music was awarded to George Pearl for Wind Quintet No. 4 for Flute, Oboe, Clarinet, Horn, and Bassoon. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on January 23, 1986 at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City, right on Park Avenue. 1986 was the inaugural class of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, even though a physical museum would not be opened until 1995 in Cleveland, Ohio. Talent scout and record producer John Henry Hammond II, who was also the father of famed blues musician John P. Hammond, was the first person inducted into the Non-Performers Lifetime Achievement Award category. Radio disc jockey Alan Freed, who held the first rock and roll concert and coined the phrase rock and roll for the mainstream at least, and Sun Records owner Sam Phillips were all inducted into the non-performers category. Jimmy Rogers, Jimmy Yancey, and Robert Johnson were inducted into the early influencers category. And ten members were inducted into the performers category for the hall in its first year. They were Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Fats Domino, the Everly Brothers, Buddy Holly, Jerry Lee Lewis, James Brown, Elvis Presley, Ray Charles, and this next artist. Sam Cooke was born on January 22, 1931 in Clarksdale, Mississippi. He began his career as a kid by singing in Baptist churches. Before he, at the age of 20, he joined the gospel group The Soul Stirrers, becoming their lead singer following the departure of lead singer R.H. Harris. The group was signed to Specialty Records, which was controlled by a guy by the name of Art Roop, and became popular with their energetic performances and Cook's innovative, secular influence style of gospel. Their first song that they recorded was Jesus Gave Me Water. Gospel hits like Nearer to Thee and Touch the Hem of His Garment followed after that and showcased Cook's vocal styles. In 1957, with the encouragement of record producer Bumps Blackwell, Cook left the Soul Stirrers. This decision, which was originally met with skepticism, proved pretty pivotal, actually. He started recording for Specialty Records under the alias Dale Cook, with his first secular song being a reworked version of the gospel song Wonderful called Lovable. And while the song wasn't a huge hit, it did show the direction that Sam wanted to take his music. Sam recorded under his own name immediately after, as no one was actually fooled by the name change. They knew who was singing the song. At first, Sam recorded secular music under his own name with Art Roop's blessing, as Art had figured that Sam would record secular songs the way that Little Richard did which was what Roop wanted because that was where the money was at at the time and Little Richard was getting kind of popular. Cook, however, wasn't going to sing it that way. In fact, when Roop walked into the recording studio one day and heard Sam singing Gershwin songs, Art blew his top. He screamed at Sam and also producer Bumps Blackwell and soon thereafter, both Sam and Bumps were off the label. Monetarily, that would be a decision that Art would soon regret. 
and regret very badly. Sam signed with Keen Records, a secular record label. His first single under Keen, called You Send Me, became a huge hit, spending three weeks at the top of the Billboard Singles chart and six weeks at the top of the Billboard R&B Singles chart. That one song took Sam from making $200 per week to making $5,000 per week. If you're trying to figure out how much money that is in today's money, that means that Sam was making $55,000 per week once you figure in inflation. Pretty decent payday for him, I would say. And like I told you, Art would soon regret actually having Sam leave his label. In 1960, Sam switched record labels again, this time to RCA Victor, which had sweetened their deal to him by giving a guaranteed $100,000 contract. That, by the way, is over $1 million in today's money. After that, the hit started rolling in with songs like Cupid, Wonderful World, Twist in the Night Away, Another Saturday Night, Bring It On Home to Me, and Chain Gang. In 1961, Sam started his own record label called SAR. A shrewd businessman, Cook defied the industry norms of the time. In establishing his own record label, he also established his own publishing company, securing rights for his songwriting rights, and his own management firm called CAGS Music. And this empowered him to nurture the careers of other rising stars like Bobby Womack and Johnny Taylor. Cook and his management team also arranged a distribution deal with RCA Victor in exchange for song ownership in yearly cash advances of over $1 million in today's money, with RCA getting 6% royalties. As the civil rights movement gained momentum, Cook's music began to reflect the social and political realities of the time. Songs like A Change Is Gonna Come, which was released posthumously in 1965, became an anthem for the movement, expressing a powerful message of hope and resilience. On the evening of December 11, 1964, Sam Cook checked into the Hacienda Motel in Los Angeles. He did not leave the hotel alive. According to the testimony of motel manager Bertha Franklin, Cook attempted to rape his companion, Alyssa Boyer, who he took to the motel that night. Once Boyer escaped the attempted rape, she ran to get the manager. Once Cook realized that Boyer had escaped, he ran down to the manager's office, demanding to know where Boyer was hiding. Cook then attacked Franklin, who shot him three times. Franklin was later acquitted on murder charges, and the case was ruled justifiable homicide. There has since been some major doubt thrown at that story. Some people believe that Boyer went to the motel willingly and actually robbed Cook and then fled, which was why Cook was enraged. Boyer had been arrested for prostitution before, so I guess it's not really out of the realm of possibility that it could have gone down that way. Others think that Cook's manager orchestrated the whole killing because all the copyrights to Cook's songs went to his manager's company. However, since both of those possibilities were outside the initial scope of the investigation, they were never pursued. While he was alive, Sam Cooke released 11 studio albums, two live albums, and four compilation albums. Of those, only four hit the top 40 in America. 1958 self-titled debut hit number 16. 1962's compilation album, The Best of Sam Cooke, hit number 22. 1962's live album, Sam Cooke at the Copa, hit number 22 on the pop chart and number 1 on the R&B chart. And 1964's Ain't That Good News, which was the last album released before his unfortunate death, hit number 34. He had two albums that were released in 1965, with only one of those, Shake, doing well. It hit number one on the Billboard R&B chart. Sam also released 37 singles while he was alive. Of those, 29 hit the top 40 on the American charts, with 16 of those 29 hitting the top 10, including four that hit number one. 
There were 12 that were released after he was killed, with four of those 12 going top 40 and two of those four hitting the top 10. Sam was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, was called one of the greatest artists of all time and the fourth greatest singer of all time. He's also had a street named after him in Chicago, Illinois, and yet he never received a Grammy Award except for a Lifetime Achievement Award. The circumstances of Sam's death have not affected his reputation over the years, unlike other artists whose personal behaviors have overshadowed their accomplishments. Sam is credited as the, quote, inventor, end quote, of soul music, helping artists like Aretha Franklin and James Brown by moving from gospel to secular music without doing the wild stage antics of Little Richard. Sam has been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice, once as a solo artist in 1986 in its first class, and once with the Soul Stirrers in 1989. Presented for induction by 2006 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Herb Albert, the King of Soul, Sam Cooke inducted into the inaugural class of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1986. And we, of course, have put some of his music onto this week's podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History in Depth podcast where we go more in depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History in Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This week, we're going to look at the case for putting the Champaign, Illinois band REO Speedwagon into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As is the usual case, to the tale of the tape we go. REO Speedwagon released 16 studio albums, 10 live albums, and 22 compilation albums. Of those, six hit the top 40 in America, with three of those six going top 10. 1980's High Infidelity went to number one, and 1982's Good Trouble and 1984's Wheels Are Turning both hit number seven. The album High Infidelity has also sold 10 million copies, while the group itself has sold over 40 million albums in total. REO Speedwagon also released 34 singles. Of those, 22 hit the top 40 on the various American charts, with 10 of those 22 hitting the top 10, including 1980's Keep On Loving You and 1984's Can't Fight This Feeling, both hitting number one, and of course, both being ballads. As far as who they've influenced, well, there aren't any that I could find that you could actually say were influenced by them, at least from them saying that they were influenced by them. So why are we even considering them for the induction argument? Well, in a word, Foreigner. Foreigner is comparable to Speedwagon in terms of time period and also popularity with a number of hits and similar touring popularity as Speedwagon still sells out stadiums on those nostalgia concert tours, especially when they get packaged up with artists like Pat Benatar, Journey, and Loverboy. Unlike Foreigner, though, Speedwagon's not in the hall, as Foreigner now is a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that is, as of 2024. REO Speedwagon's first single was released in 1972, which means that they've actually been eligible for hall induction since 1997. So far, they haven't even been considered. But maybe now that the hall is under new management and is looking to beef up their 70s and 80s band roster, They might want to consider REO Speedwagon for the induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. After all, Foreigner's in, and they have very similar music with rock and ballads that both hit number one. So, why not REO Speedwagon? 
And to give you a taste, we've also put their music onto this week's podcast playlist. The link, as I've said before, is in the show notes. There are many walks of fame in the world. There's the Aerospace Walk of Honor in Lancaster, California, the Almeria Walk of Fame in Almeria, Spain, the Australian Film Walk of Fame in Sydney, Australia. However, when you think of walks of fame, you really only think of one. You know, it's the most famous walk of fame of them all. It is the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Hollywood, California. The idea for the walk was dreamed up by E.M. Stewart, who was president of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce back in 1953. People think that the idea for having stars came from the Hollywood Hotel, which had stars on the ceiling of their dining room. The final parameters for the project were agreed upon in 1955 and presented to the Los Angeles City Council in 1956. Construction for the walk began in 1958 and ended in 1960. There were eight people who were supposed to be given stars first. Olive Borden, Ronald Coleman, Louise Fazenda, Preston Foster, Burt Lancaster, Edward Sedgwick, Ernest Torrance, and Joanne Woodward. However, director Stanley Kramer is credited with having his star installed onto the actual Walk of Fame first on March 28, 1960. Popular myth is that Joanne Woodward was the first star, but she was the first person to be photographed posing with her star, so that myth has kind of stuck. The walk covers 1.3 miles down Hollywood Boulevard with a few side streets added as space permits. As of this recording, there are 2,784 stars. The stars are awarded into five categories, film, television, theater slash live performance, radio, and music. For this podcast, we'll only be dealing with artists who were awarded in at least either the radio or the music categories. People who get stars have to pay $50,000 for the upkeep to the star. Every year, the Chamber of Commerce gets over 200 names for consideration for a star, but only 20 to 24 stars are awarded during a normal year. There has only been one star that is not actually on a sidewalk. It is Muhammad Ali's, because he did not want it to be walked on because he was a champion. That makes sense. He was inducted into the theater-slash-live performance category, even though he was a boxing star. He did sing a song that actually hit the Billboard charts at one time. His star, by the way, is on a wall at Hollywood and Highland at 6801 Hollywood Boulevard. There have also been special stars given out to people who were part of the Hollywood community, such as former Los Angeles mayor, the late Tom Bradley, and honorary mayor of Hollywood and the guy most associated with promoting the Walk of Fame, the late great Johnny Grant. There have also been stars given as well to people who were not entertainers, but who had done important things, such as the crew of Apollo 11. Usually, those stars are put in the live performance category, as those things usually happen on television. There have been two presidents who were given stars, Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. Reagan was given one for his radio and acting career, and Trump because of his TV show The Apprentice. Only one star so far in the history of the Walk of Fame has ever been considered officially for removal from the Walk of Fame, and you would think that it would be, say, Bill Cosby or Michael Jackson or someone with something along the murder-slash-sexual-assault-slash-whatever line. No, it's Donald Trump. As of yet... No final decision has been made about removing it. Politics, you know. I would figure as of now, it's going to be on there and I wouldn't even worry about it. What's going on? Sexual healing. How sweet it is to be loved by you. Those are just three of the songs that our next artist made famous. And while it seemed to the public that he lived a charmed life, behind the scenes, 
it was anything but charmed. The same demons that controlled many other artists controlled him as well, and his death, or rather the way that he died, was one of the most shocking moments in music history. Marvin Gaye was born on April 2, 1939 in Washington, D.C. His father was a minister while his mother was a domestic worker. He enjoyed singing from a young age when he started singing in his father's church. His father was also extremely strict and would beat Marvin over any childhood transgression. Marvin went into the Air Force after high school. He didn't really like how strict it was, so he faked mental illness and got a general discharge. He returned to Washington, where he formed a singing group called the Marquis. While performing around the D.C. area, they came into contact with Bo Diddley, who got them signed to one of Columbia Records' smaller labels. When their first single failed to become a hit, they were unfortunately dropped from the record label. Right around that time, there was a group called the Moonglows. The co-founder of the Moonglows, Harvey Fuqua, liked the Marquis' sound and signed them to an employee's contract. He moved the group to Chicago, Illinois, where they worked as session singers while recording their own material, which was when Marvin started writing songs. During a performance at the home of Barry Gordy, who was the head of Motown Records, Barry noticed Marvin's talent and arranged with Fuqua for Marvin to join the Motown family. Marvin's Motown career started off slowly. He was a session drummer while trying to get his own records to sell. His debut album, The Soulful Moods of Marvin Gaye, flopped miserably. It wasn't until 1962 that things started clicking for him. Late in 1962, he released his first solo hit, Stubborn Kind of Fellow. Things started humming after that. Hit after hit started coming his way, and he started doing duet albums. His first one with Mary Wells was a big hit. He had the hit It Takes Two with Kim Weston. He also had a bunch of hits with Tammy Terrell, including Ain't No Mountain High Enough and Your Precious Love. During a performance together in 1967, Tammy collapsed on stage into Marvin's arms. Tammy, as it turns out, was suffering from a brain tumor. She would have multiple operations and would quit live performing, and she would later pass away from brain cancer in 1970. Her illness and death affected Marvin greatly. Marvin recorded What's Going On, but Barry Gordy thought that the album was too political. Marvin stopped recording in protest until Motown released the song What's Going On and also the album What's Going On. Both the song and the album would go on to become huge hits and are now considered to be some of the greatest music ever to be recorded, making many a best-of-all-time list. And it was at that point that Marvin knew that eventually he would have to gain more creative control over his own music. By the time he recorded his last album for Motown in 1978, things were not really going too well for him. First off, he was getting divorced. Second, he was dealing with the IRS over back taxes. And third, and possibly most important, he was dealing with that old musical demon, drugs, specifically cocaine. To escape everything, Marvin went to Europe. When Motown released his last album with them, Marvin realized that they had changed the mixing and editing. He was furious, vowing never to do another album with them. In 1982, Motown released Marvin from his contract. He then landed at CBS Records, where he recorded his comeback album, Midnight Love, with the smash hit song, Sexual Healing. During the tour for that album, he became more and more dependent upon cocaine. He had gotten sober for a time when he was in Europe, and it looked like he would be fine, but that was not to be. It got so bad that it got to the point where he moved back in with his parents who had relocated to Los Angeles at that time. A very big mistake, as it would turn out. Remember that Marvin and his father had a really bad relationship. Marvin even added the letter E to his last name of Gay, G-A-Y, in part to get people to stop making fun of his last name, but to also symbolically get further away from his dad. 
Marvin decided, though, after all these years, that he wanted to finally make peace with his dad. For Christmas in 1983, Marvin gave his dad a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber handgun to use as protection. Big mistake number one, moving back in with his parents. Big mistake number two, giving his dad a gun. The drugs had made Marvin suicidal and paranoid. He attempted to commit suicide on March 28, 1984 by jumping in front of a car, but he only got a few bruises from it. Also during that time, Marvin's parents were arguing a lot, mainly over some missing insurance papers. On April 1, 1984, Marvin's parents argued about those papers yet again. Marvin tried protecting his mother when his dad came upstairs to confront his mom. Marvin pushed his dad out of the room, told him not to come back in, beat him, and punched him. Marvin followed his dad into his dad's bedroom, still kicking and beating him. Marvin's mother pulled him away and told him to go back to his own room. A few minutes later, Marvin's father came back upstairs and went to Marvin's room. He opened the door. In his hand was that very same handgun that Marvin had given his father that Christmas before in order to protect himself. Marvin's dad pointed the gun at his own son and fired twice, once hitting Marvin in his heart and once hitting him in his left shoulder. Marvin Gaye passed away less than an hour later, one day before his 45th birthday. His father would be tried for murder, but once it was determined that he acted in self-defense, he was given a six-month suspended sentence and five years of probation. Marvin Gaye's father passed away in 1998 in a nursing home. As with a lot of sudden deaths, there is, of course, a conspiracy theory. This one says that Marvin wanted to commit suicide but couldn't do it himself, especially after failing only a few days before when he jumped in front of that speeding car and he managed to survive. The conspiracy theory goes that Marvin purposely enraged his father, knowing that his father would kill him as his father had stated many times that if a child of his ever raised their hand to him, he would kill them. Most parents are only half kidding when they say that. Not Marvin's dad, not by a long shot. No pun intended. I'm not sure if Marvin did do that, and the fact is, honestly, we're never going to know. We only have witness reports to go by. So, what we do know was that the world was completely shocked. I think most people would have believed a drug overdose or maybe even a suicide, but getting shot by your own father... Okay, that was a new one. On MTV's Most Shocking Things to Happen in Music list, Marvin Gaye's Death by His Own Dad ranks in at number eight. John Lennon's death, by the way, is number one. Located at 1500 Vine Street on the corner of Sunset Boulevard and in front of the Chase Bank, you will find Marvin Gaye's star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And also to remind you of how good Marvin Gaye really was, we've put his greatest hits onto this week's podcast playlist. The link, as I've already said twice before, is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.